Well, good morning and welcome to another episode of the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is James. I work in the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. I have Talia helping with the magic behind me and Miss Kaya is on question control. We're going to talk about invertebrates today. Do you know what invertebrates are? Are there invertebrates in here? Hmm. Well, if you don't know what an invertebrate is, we should start there. So what does that big word actually mean? Well, let's take a look. That's actually see-through today. Never mind. We had to change the settings, and so now my yellow sign is invisible. Well, all right. In vertebrate. So the main part of that big word is vertebrate or verta, like our vertebrae. So if you reach behind you, you can feel your backbone. Or sometimes, oh, you're stretching. Oh, I popped my backbone. You have vertebra in your back. We have parts to our skeleton that give us shape and function. Now, a fish like this one, or a shark like that one, they don't have bones like we do, but they do have a skeleton. So imagine the body of a person. The insides of us, we have a skeleton. It helps us stand up. We have skeletal parts in our fingers to move around. We have two things to our skeleton. We have bone and cartilage. Cartilage is like what's in our ears or our noses. Or if you're a shark, cartilage is in their whole body. They have no bone. Their whole skeleton is cartilage. Well, what about an invertebrate? Well, when we look at that big word, invertebrate, it, in, when you put it in the beginning of a science word, means no. So no vertebra, no, no spine, or commonly what we would say, no backbone. So invertebrates have no skeletal parts to their body on the insides. They're very different from what we think of. All right, let's practice again. Think of an animal, any animal you could possibly think of. You don't have to worry about things in the ocean. You can think of things in the air, in the trees, on land, in the soil. Do you have an animal ready? Oh, those are really cool animals. I can sense your animal thoughts. Not really. I'm pretending. Let's actually take a look at some invertebrates on my special camera. So keep that invertebrate animal in your mind. When you're thinking of an invertebrate, was it any of these? Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Well, if you were already thinking of ocean animals, there's... You might have been thinking of things like a sea urchin or a clam or coral, but there's a lot of animals that don't have a skeleton or backbone. They have other hard parts or no parts that are hard at all. 98% of all the life on the planet that we have found is an invertebrate. That's a lot of them. Most of the animals we usually think of might have a backbone. A lot of people I talk to think of like their pets, their cats and their dogs or birds, or maybe land animals that they really like from the zoos. But if you think about all the potential life on the planet, that's a very small representation of things with backbones. And when scientists started cataloging everything and recording who does and does not have a backbone, we started realizing that most of our planet is more like this and less of them are like us. That's interesting. We had to learn more about how this works. So let's pick a couple animals from our selection. Uh, I like this one, mostly because it's one of my favorite animals. They're creepy and gross, and that's why I like them. Um, let's also do this one, the coral. All right, so let's scooch the others out of the way. We'll come back to them later. Don't worry. Ta -da! Now, the one right here is a deep sea isopod. That is a piece of coral. Now, we don't really have any images, or we do have an image of a giant isopod, but not a little guy. So Miss Talia might find a giant isopod to show us. But we have lots of things of coral we can show you too. Now the isopods, how would you describe this animal? Hmm. Well, maybe we should zoom in a little bit to the isopod so we can take a closer look. Now. Sometimes in the invertebrate world, we have to figure out 
what sides the front and what sides the back because that definitely does help now even though this side might look like er teeth and antenna that's actually the tail and over here is its face well it's hard to tell in this case but if i gently flip it over we can see its legs there we go so this thing has legs has a tail has all these fun little mouth parts up front right there i'm trying to make, watch my little screen with my hands on it and direct on here okay so here's our isopod right now if you wanted to think of the isopods closest land-based relative it would be a roly-poly or sometimes people call them pill bugs or sow bugs so pill bugs and roly polies are like deep sea isopods well they're in the isopod group hmm. that's why it might look so familiar now when i was a kid i used to put roly polies in my pockets because i loved them so much i'd collect them and then i'd forget they were there now this is when i was a very little kid i don't do this now we roly polies were there i didn't know that back then i thought they were so cool i'd take them with me well, this animal can do a very similar thing. It doesn't really fold up into a ball. But the roly-poly that you might find in your garden is a crustacean just like this one. It is an animal that needs water, has a skeleton on the outside, and is an invertebrate, no backbone. Now, I have a couple questions coming in. How do we get animals to this aquarium is a good question from Mrs. Nicolosi's class. Well, some of the animals that are preserved, we can, eat. sometimes people donate them to us, or we can get them from organizations that provide specimens for zoos and aquariums and museums. But most of the live animals came from another zoo or aquarium, or they were born here. Sometimes they come from rescue centers. So it depends on the animal. There are groups that will have animals that breed specifically to provide them for a zoo and aquarium. So that way we're not going out to the ocean and picking up all the different animals that we could possibly have here. We do sometimes get permits to get them because we can't just go out and pick up whatever animal we want. Then if we do that too much, there's not enough animals for everybody. So we can get a permit to go collect so many sea stars or so many kinds of seaweed. We actually have to get permits or let people know that we're going to go get seaweed to collect. So it's important to know that we're getting our animals from the correct sources. And that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Now, Avery's asking a question that kind of transitions into our other animal on the board. Avery asked, how is coral alive? You know, Avery, that is a good question because if you look at this, this doesn't look very lively, does it? Well, let's try looking at an image or a video of some live coral. And then we can try and see what the differences are. So make some quick observations. I see little holes, kind of whitish yellow, maybe dark over here in the corner. But what? What's going on here? What do you see now? Well, all this coral, even the stuff right here up in the top, this coral over here, it's all alive. It's an animal. Now, think of things that are living. What do they do when they're alive? Well, they eat if they're not a plant. Well, sometimes if you're a plant, exceptions to the rule. So they have to get energy from somewhere. Either it's by consuming food or doing photosynthesis or the things in the deep ocean that don't need any sunlight. It's called chemosynthesis. So they have to get energy from somewhere. All right. So that's important to be able to be alive. They have to be able to reproduce. They have to be able to get oxygen. So when we breathe, we're inhaling a lot of oxygen. We're releasing the carbon dioxide that our body has produced. These fish are doing the same thing, but without lungs. They're doing it with their gills. This coral is doing it just by absorbing across their skin. So some animals or other plants and algae can do it very differently than we do. They get their oxygen in a different way. Plants and algae get oxygen from themselves they make it so they don't need to breathe but all these other animals have to 
get oxygen or breathe in some way. So those are your basics for being alive. You don't have to have a brain. You don't have to have legs or fins. You could actually be a lump on the floor, literally, because some coral are, and you're a living organism. So that's the cool thing. We think of that you have to have all these special parts to be able to be alive, and you really don't. You have to get energy, get oxygen, have babies at some point, and I've got the fourth one. Oh, well, but they're still alive. So we can do all these things. They can do all these things. That's how we are similar. So even though we're very different from a coral or sea sponge or a fish or a shark or even a bird, we have a lot of similarities, don't we? Okay, so now that we know that what makes us and invertebrates very similar, let's start looking at all the cool different kinds of invertebrates that there could be. So I'm going to go back to my fun creatures on the document camera. We'll come back to the pretty videos. Don't worry. Now, oh, I forgot to share one important thing about coral. Hold on. Let's back that up. Okay. This whole piece of coral is not one animal. No, no, no. This is a colony of animals. What? All right. All these little holes. Actually, let's see how much I can zoom in to the coral. Super zoom. Oh, oh, that is, that's going to work just beautifully. So look at all these little holes and gaps in our coral piece. Each of those little crevices is where one individual coral body would be. So coral grows as a, you know, as, as a colony, as a group of animals, all creating their own shell or exoskeleton around them. It's the rocky structure we see. And they all grow on top of each other. And then it's often done by cloning. They can clone themselves to grow bigger. And then each of these little holes would have one individual in it. Now, Jimmy's asking, what gives invertebrates structure? Oh. I'm going to get to that in a sec, because that's kind of a, a tough thing to talk about. But I'm going to try and use words that we'll all be able to understand. But Lily is asking, what is the smallest of the invertebrates? Well, even corals like this are not the smallest thing. What could you imagine could be smaller than a coral? Even one coral, individual body in that one tiny little crevice. We actually interact with them all the time in the ocean. They're all over the ocean. They're the most frequent things in the ocean. The most prominent animal in the ocean is microscopic plankton. They count as an invertebrate animal. Even the tiniest of little invertebrate things that we can barely see with our eyes without a microscope or magnifying glass, they count as animals. That is the tiniest of all invertebrates. Great question, Lily. Now, we look at anemones and corals, jellies. Actually, let's take a look at a jelly. Because they're cousins of this animal, and I have an example of a, a fake jelly-like thing. So let's switch over to looking at a jelly real quick. But while we're doing that, for Talia to get some time to do that, this invisible can of water has plastic in it. Now, it, we use it as a, an example of, actually, actually, top of me, you can see it. So we use it as an example of things sometimes look like jellies in the ocean, and animals will get confused and eat the wrong stuff. So this plastic, when it's out on the countertop or the table, does it have a whole lot of structure? Is it doing anything? No, not really. So the thing that gives a lot of invertebrate animals structure, Jimmy, is water. A lot of animals in the ocean have something called a hydrostatic skeleton. Now, we use skeleton as a word to describe bones. But a skeleton, think of it as something that provides structure. So the skeletal body of that isopod is the shell on the outside. What about a snail shell? Hmm. Well, that's not really giving them structure as much as it is giving them a safe space to hide in. So not all shells count as a skeletal structure part of their body. Okay. Well, then there's things like sea stars who have bony plates in their skin. And even though they still use water to help maintain shape, those bony plates in their skin help provide some shape too. So you're not going to see a sea star suddenly inflate to become a circle, 
Well, that would be kind of funny to see, but that's not how their bodies work. The water gives it some shape, but the rest of their body provides the rest of the shape. So those jellies, those anemones, actually have to have water in their body so they can stand up. And then they can squish the water out if they want to shrivel up. So like this one, this anemone right here, is curled up, pulled all its tentacles inside. It has little muscles in its body. It can do that. And it can shrink up if it needs to to help keep the food in. Or sometimes if they're exposed in the air during a low tide, it helps protect them so they still have water in their body even though they're outside the water for a short amount of time. Well, we have a lot of questions, so we're going to move away from the hydrostatic skeleton, Jimmy, but that's a really cool question. I would say investigate some more, and if you have more questions about how animals get structure without bones, email us at live at lbaop.org, because that's a really big topic. It's not an easy thing to always explain, but I would hope everybody was able to understand it from what we were talking about now. Okay, Carson's asking, how big can an isopod get? Oh my gosh. Did we find the picture of the giant isopod? Oh. It's hiding somewhere in, in the second computer. I'm giving Talia a hint. Um, they can get pretty big. So the deep sea isopod that we saw is only like that much. But the giant deep sea isopod lives up to its name. They get like 10 to 12 inches long. They're huge. I think they're really cool when they swim. So they're not just crawling around. They actually can swim a little bit. Their little feet kick. Real hard, their tail is wide and flared out like a lobster tail almost, and they can kick their tail a little bit to help them swim. So deep sea isopods can get very large, Carson, and that's one of the things I love about them. One, because they look like roly polies, which I've always loved, and two, they're ginormous, which I also think is just so awesome. Okay, Greta's asking, is a turtle shell a bone? Ooh, Greta, you've touched on an important idea. Maybe Miss Kai can run and grab me a turtle shell when we get a second. She's very quickly and very actively answering as many questions as possible. Greta, this is such a cool question that we didn't prepare a turtle shell for this because I didn't think that might come up because I don't often get asked that question. So while we wait for the turtle shell, we're going to answer Claudia's question of, do sharks have a backbone? Yes, they do. They have a skeleton inside. So they have a spinal column. We have a spinal column. But sharks are this way, so their spinal column goes that way. So they have a spine. They have bones in their body. Thank you, Ms. Kaya. So they do count as a vertebrate, even though they don't have true bones. They have an internal skeleton, so they are a vertebrate. Well, looking at our turtle friend here and helping Greta out, so even though this is a reptile, and it's hard to imagine how bones work in a reptile, these lines in here, these are the ribs. Now, the shell itself is not all bone. In fact, the shell itself is not really bone, but the bones are in the shell, at least their ribs are. And their spinal column, their vertebra, are part of the shell too. So sometimes in cartoons we see animals get out of their shell. Whew. Well, that doesn't really happen in nature. They are part of the shell. They grow this shell. So a snail grows its own shell. Let's compare shell to shell, but shells in different things. This tiny little snail shell I pulled that we were looking at, this one right here, I think this is a cowrie snail shell. The snail is connected to the shell. It grows the shell like we grow fingernails, just like the turtle is connected to its shell. But this doesn't count as an exoskeleton. Remember, the shell itself on a turtle is not really bone, but the bones become part of the shell. They're embedded or inside parts of the shell. But a snail shell is part of the snail. It's not an exoskeleton because it's not the same kind of shell. But it is part of a snail. And they grow it. And when the snail passes away, they leave behind an empty shell that other fun little invertebrates like to hide in. Hermit crabs, you're right. Hermit crabs do hide in little empty shells. It's one of the fun things that they like to do. Okay, Emily is asking, do fish like coral? Why do, oh, why do fish like coral? Because they're pretty. Nah, it's not right away. Miss Tolly did find the giant isopod picture. So before we show you more coral, I want to show you a giant isopod because I think they're cute. They're creepy cute, but they're cute. Okay.
Oh, I love it. They're just so different from things that we might think of as animals or even living things. They have all these fun little creepy legs. There's their tail. They can help them swim. They have antenna. And they have eyes. So they're really cool animals. They can kind of curl up, not like a roly-poly does on land, but they're really cool. Now, this isopod, I think this is actually one of ours that we had for a while. Like I said, they get about 10, 12 inches long. They, they get pretty big. Now, why would fish like coral? That's an interesting question. It's their home. It's a habitat. So habitats are where things live. Coral is not only a living thing, like trees are a living thing, and animals live among the trees. Coral is alive, and that's the home for animals. They like to hide in it. Some animals actually will feed on the algae that grows on top of it. Some animals actually accidentally eat the coral itself. But that's why they like it. It's part of their environment. It's part of their home. Now, Elena's asking, how does coral get its coral? How does it grow more of it? Mm, that is a good question, too. So let's take a look, another look at some coral. So we said coral can clone itself. What it's doing is it's splitting in two and creating two individuals that are identical. So it's kind of how identical human twins start out. You have one embryo, it splits into two embryos, and now they're the same thing, but you grow two of them. Well, coral does this, but on an, a huge scale. And a lot of all of this animal right here is all cloning itself. It's all replicas. But it will also reproduce sexually. So it has sperm and egg that are released up into the water. They would meet, make an embryo. Embryo lands on something, grows into new coral. So they reproduce in both ways. They clone themselves, asexual reproduction, and sexual reproduction, broadcast spawning. Okay. Sarah's asking, oh, that was Sarah's question. Well, Sarah and Elena, I'm glad I could answer your question. Pamela asked, why is coral important to the ocean ecosystem? Hmm. That is a big question, Pamela. It's really because of a lot of things we mentioned. It's a habitat itself, but it also contains really important parts. And inside each one of these coral bodies is a tiny little algae. Well, it's, a, it's almost like an algae. So inside each little individual is something called zooxanthellae. Another big fun science word that it's a living little thing inside another thing. So this photosynthetic microscopic organism that lives inside each coral provides oxygen and food for the coral. Coral's still an animal. And at night, the coral are more likely to feed on plankton that swim by. But there's not a ton of plankton in this water. When you look at a coral reef, it's a very clear water system. Compared to California, we get in the water, it can be pretty murky. Well, the murky or cloudy effect in California waters is a lot of plankton and a lot of nutrients. Tropical water has less of that. So to help, coral adapted the ability to hang out with a little algae buddy inside its body, kind of become roommates, and the algae provides oxygen and food for the coral. And the coral gets a home. Or the zooxanthellae gets a home inside the coral. So they're really important to ecosystems because they are the infrastructure. They are the base foundation of a coral reef system. And you think about how coral reefs, they're not covering the entire planet, but coral reef, uh, a single coral reef, has a lot of diversity in it. Of all the coral reefs on all the planet, Scientists think that over a quarter of all ocean diversity, or all the kinds of things that live in the ocean, live in this one kind of habitat. So that's really the importance of it, is that coral reefs are incredibly diverse, incredibly important ecosystems that support not only a lot of sea life, but a lot of people too. These fish would have babies in the coral reef. Those babies might venture out for people to commercially or recreationally fish. So we rely on the coral reef, and so do all the other things living in the coral reef. All right, we have a few minutes left. Jeremiah is asking, how do jellies and sea stars eat? I'm glad you asked because this is more gross fun that I like to talk about. So jellies, jellies are an opportunistic feeder. Now what I mean by that is, 
Let's imagine we put a blindfold on you. You had to wander around a buffet. We didn't tell you where it was, though. You had to randomly bump into something in order to eat. You had to bump into it like, that's food. Ah. That's kind of how jellies work. They are drifters. They're plankton themselves. Even though they're big animals, they are plankton. They don't swim where they really, really want to. They go where the ocean is pushing them. Even in our exhibit space here, we have a gentle current that pushes them around. They have to run into their food inadvertently or accidentally in order to eat. These long, skinny tentacles you see on them are the stinging tentacles. They grab the food, hold on to it, and then the big fluffy ones in the middle, let's use you for an example, those big fluffy ones, help pull the food off the tentacles and put it in their mouth. It's a slow process, but that's how jellies eat. They slowly move around, randomly run into their food, sting it, and slowly eat it. So being a jelly is, it looks kind of fun and very calming, actually. But it's not always the easiest to get food. Now, sea stars, on the other hand, sea stars are a little more gross, which makes them, in my opinion, a lot more fun. So let's observe our sea stars in this tide pool touch lab. Do you see the sea stars jumping up and swimming around? Doing cartwheels, flying around. Not so much, right? They're really not going anywhere. Or if they do, they're very slow. I haven't done my sea star impersonation in a while. You want to see how fast a sea star likes to walk? All right. Sea star. It's really good that we have so much time during our class for us to be sea stars and walk very, very slowly. That's really how it goes. They're very slow walking animals. Some sea stars can walk pretty quick for a sea star, not quick compared to us. So if they're on the floor and they're slow walkers, do you think their food is going to be really, really fast? Probably not. If they have to slowly chase their food, they can't really chase the fast, even crawling things, can they? So instead, they'll eat the things that sit still. Sometimes a snail, because snails are not the fastest either, but snails are much faster than a clam or a scallop or a mussel. So these other animals with shells that don't walk anywhere, what they'll do, the sea stars crawl on top of it, then their very powerful legs will pull the shell open just a tiny bit, and then they spit their stomach inside. They evert or throw up their stomach out of their body onto the surface, and then they wrap it around their food. So you can actually see the food right about there. teeth. They don't have a jaw to <laughs> chew on things. They don't even have a hard mouth like a beak, like an octopus or a squid has, to break open the shell. They have to pull open shells and spit their stomach inside. Or even if you go back to in a little snail shell, they spit their stomach out just enough to the outside of the, uh, the snail shell to start digesting it, and then they'll slurp everything in, but spit the shells out. So sea stars are pretty good predators, but they're not going to catch anything moving around that's moving very quickly. Great questions from everybody today. We learned quite a bit about invertebrates, quite a bit about how invertebrates are very important to our ecosystem too. So those questions you were all asking about that, remember invertebrates, animals without a backbone, make up 98 something percent. That's approximate. They make most of all kinds of animals on the planet. They're pretty important for us to have in our ecosystem. So as you think about ecosystems, look past all the big interesting animals like the fish and the sharks and the whales and the dolphins and even the, her the hermit crabs, which are pretty charismatic and fun animals, and think about all the varieties that could be out there. Well, 
We appreciate you joining us for our Monday 10 o'clock class. If you're watching after this was aired live, feel free to email us more questions at live at lbaop.org. If we have school teachers out there, we're trying to help make sure that we can do our best to work with our groups out there, provide special content for you. So text us the number of students you have watching right now. If you're showing our programs to your students, this number right here, 562-286-1838, and we're going to tabulate how many students we have watching. We'll be back Wednesday morning for more Aquarium Online Academy. So have fun and tune in on Wednesday.